All right, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Susan Nell. I work in the Liberal Arts Career Enrichment Network, and we're really happy to see you today. And I'm really pleased to uh, be joined by Kevin Wolforst, who is a alumna, an alumnus of the college, uh, but also a supervisory intelligence analyst for the Federal Bureau of Investigation and a retired US Army Major General. So a little bit about Kevin. He's, a, as I said, a supervisory intelligence analyst with the FBI in their Newark, New Jersey field office, where he leads a team of intelligence analysts and staff operations specialists who provide threat intelligence research and analysis to investigations that identify and mitigate threats related to public corruption, healthcare fraud, and civil rights crimes. He's served in the FBI since 2004, and prior to joining the FBI, he was a manager in the change management practice of the Accenture Metro New York office from 1996 to 2004. As an army officer, specifically a major general, he served on active duty and reserve for over 34 years with a variety of assignments across the world. In his last assignment, he served on active duty as the assistant deputy chief of staff for intelligence for the US Army in the Pentagon from 2016 to 2020, and has received numerous awards throughout his career. Kevin graduated from Penn State with bachelor's of arts degrees in history and Russian, and is also a graduate of the armor officers basic and advanced courses, the military intelligence officer transition course, counterintelligence and imagery analysis courses, the signal officers advanced course, the combined arms and services staff school, the command and general staff college, and the advanced joint professional military academy, and the US Army War College. So he's got some credentials people. Um, he also earned a master of education degree in human services and human resource administration from Boston University and holds a master of science in strategic intelligence from the National Intelligence University and a Master of Strategic Tuddy Studies from the U.S. Army War College. So we're very excited that Kevin's here to share his experience and advice with you today about careers in the U.S. intelligence community. And so with that, I'm going to get his slides going here and turn it over to Kevin. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Susan. I will just uh, jump right in. So what I just want to say is the uh, in the agenda, I'm going to talk about intelligence, uh, what intelligence analysts do, uh, what the who is in the intelligence community, and then uh, talk about ways to uh, start your career in intelligence. So the, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I think, is valuable for students to actually understand what intelligence is, because it's not necessarily uh, what you see on TV. So uh, I'll just go ahead and start. I, are the slides up? I don't see them yet. Oh, uh, no. Uh, Sorry. Uh, there would have to be one thing that wouldn't go yes, quite this right. Time, right? So, right. So, th so that's what I'm going to, to talk about uh, there. Oh, excellent. Uh, so uh, you've already had, heard my background. Uh, I, I was a history major. My uh, path into, uh, you can just go to the next slide. And you can bring the agenda up. It, ha it flies in, but you can just click through to the, it says Intel Career Resources. That's the last bullet. Uh, so my background is uh, I, my, I began my career in intelligence through the military. Uh, I was an ROTC, commissioned as an armor officer, uh, served in Germany, and then did what's called a branch transfer. I transferred for, to the military intelligence branch in the army and received my intelligence training through the uh, Army Intelligence School, and then stayed uh, four years on active duty, then transferred to the reserves. Uh, in 2003, I was mobilized to do intelligence work, decided I was much more passionate about that than working at Accenture. And so when I left active duty, I joined the FBI so that I could be a civilian uh, intel analyst so while I stayed in the reserves. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is what intelligence is I, I'm going to talk more about a career in intelligence, and then at the end, I'll talk about some resources and a path you can take as a student to uh, join the intelligence community. But I, I, I really didn't understand what intelligence was until I started my Army training, so I know most of you may not have specific classes that talk about the intelligence community. All right, you can go to the next slide, Susan. So, uh, yeah, perfect. So this is the bluff. D d d d has, has anyone heard the word bluff before? And, and can someone put in chat or question what, a bl what bluff is? Yeah. 
Yes, excellent. Yes, it's the bottom line up front. So this is this is the basis. You know, you watch TV shows and you say, well, what is you know what does an intelligence analyst do? And this is the 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 bottom line up front. It's the an intelligence analyst takes data, processes the data to create information. I'll get into a little bit more of that when I talk about the different types of intelligence analyst roles. And then takes that information and by doing analysis uh, becomes knowledge. And using that knowledge and based on prior experience and and their own uh, technical and tactical skill set, uh, create situational awareness and understanding for a decision maker to make a decision. So the situ you, you want to understand uh, what is in your environment, and then a decision maker can make a, make a decision. So what I'm talking about specifically is intelligence analysis. I mean, there are other roles in the intelligence community, case officers that recruit sources, uh, operators uh, that can that conduct actions, but what I'm focused on sharing with you is the role of an intelligence analyst. Next slide, please, Susan. And this, you can just hit the first. Uh, I'll, 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 it's got uh, animation, so if you have to, yeah. So, so uh, actually, you can just bring them all up because I'll just talk about them. So, and there's one more. So the first four of these bullets, if, if, if I would share to you, share, share with you, everyone on the call today, what are the, what are the skills or competencies that an intelligence analyst needs? So what should you focus on uh, in your academic studies that will prepare you for the role of an intelligence analyst? <clears throat> so the first two kind of go together, but the, the, the bottom line is <clears throat> understanding the social science research method. <clears throat> An analyst creates a hypothesis or an analytic line, and then using that data and information that I talked about, supports it and shares it with the decision maker. You know, So an analyst working in a military topic like North Korea would say, we assess uh, North Korea will develop a nuclear weapon capable of hitting the United States within four years. That's your hypothesis. And then they're gonna collect data to either prove or disprove it, and share that with the decision maker. So the United States, or whether you're in the State Department or in the Army, can make a, make a decision. But but that is the if that is what an analyst does day to day. I do this in the FBI. You know, we one of my analysts said we are we are legalizing marijuana for recreational use. We assess it will have the following impacts: increased public corruption. Uh, Etc. And then we look for data and uh, to prove or disprove that. And we use critical thinking skills when we're looking at that data. So I highly recommend uh, understanding the different types of metacognition or thinking about your thinking. So if you can take a course or even a seminar on critical thinking, what's what what mindsets and biases are, how you do uh, alternative hypothesis, how you use structured analytic techniques. Uh, uh, an analyst has to be a good critical thinker. Where is this information that's coming coming from? What is the motivation of the person sharing it? Who who someone? If you read a news article, what is the bias of that article? So you have to always be constantly thinking about your thinking and understand your own frame of reference, and that's that's very important uh, in intelligence analysis. Then you have to be able to write and speak well because you need to be able to put your hypothesis and your findings into a clear, concise, crisp, written format that makes sense, uh, a journalistic style of writing. Uh, and then you have to share that with decision makers. So you do a lot of briefings and a lot of presentations. So those, those four things, if you don't like to write or to speak, you're probably not a great candidate uh, for a career in intelligence analysis because analysts write and, and, and communicate and speak all, every day. And then finally, this is not really a competency, but a good analyst has intellectual curiosity, means meaning they want to know everything about everything that they're looking at. So if, if you're the kind of person that constantly wants to discover new things, maybe take a college, a course at Penn State, 
that might have nothing to do with your major, but you've always been interested. Now, when I was an undergrad, I took a class on Chaucer and we read Chaucer in Middle English just because I was interested in it. And it, 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 it was one of my electives. So if you're interested in really knowing a lot of things, that intellectual curiosity is really uh, a, something that all analysts have. And next slide, please, Susan. Uh, and these just bring up one bullet at a time. Yeah, so just to stop there. So, so there are different types of intelligence analyst roles in the intelligence community. And I'm going to share with you uh, the major ones so that you can understand what kind of uh, roles there are in the different intel community organizations. So the, probably the most 80% uh, or 75% of intel analysts are all source analysts. I was an all source analyst in the army, the intel analysts working in the intel shop of an army brigade or division are primarily all source analysts. Most FBI analysts are all source analysts. And if you look at the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, or the Defense Intelligence Agency, most are all source analysts. And that means they take that information and data can come from phone calls that have been recorded. It can come from satellite images. It can come from things people tell us, uh, sources that are developed. So the data can come from all different types of intelligence collection. And an all source analyst looks at all of that to uh, build that situational understanding. Next slide, please. Now, there is a specialty of geospatial analysis. It used to be called imagery analysis, and I attended imagery analyst school. So I was an all-source analyst in the Army, but I was also qualified as a geospatial analyst. Geospatial analysts look at pictures or imagery, but uh, imagery can come from infrared. It can come from satellite, electro-optical. It can come from radar imagery. There's different types of sensors that the Army and the Navy and Air Force and, and, and uh NGA have, but basically an, a geospatial analyst looks at a image of something and then draws information. So, and that, you know, uh, geospatial analysts is big with these North Korean missiles. If you see a missile, is it being refueled? Is it getting ready to launch? And a geospatial analyst not only knows about an object, but they can look at things in the pictures. Are there trucks nearby that have fuel lines? And then they'll look at that and they'll take this image of a thing and the, an imagery and they can say, this is a picture of a, this type of Nodong North Korean missile and we assess that it will be ready to launch in four days based on our analysis. So that, that is a specialty in the intelligence community. Next uh, bullet, please, Susan. Okay, yeah, this, and two will fade in. So uh, you can hit it one more time. Then there's signals intelligence. This is mostly done by the National Security Agency. And it has actually two parts to it. It has communications intelligence. So there are linguists and analysts that are listening. We are able to collect internationally uh, cell phone calls, sat satellite, call, uh, satellite phone calls, basically people talking, people communicating uh, is captured through sensors. And those analysts translate it and then make sense of what these people are talking about. <clears throat> then there's also electronics intelligence. This is primarily in the military field, but every sort of radar system has an electronic signature. So an electronics intelligence specialist will look at a radar and say, okay, that, that radar is associated with this type of plane or this type of uh, anti-aircraft missile. And so electronics intelligence specialists look at electromagnetic spectrum. They look at signatures they know what those signatures are associated with and they make sense out of it. It pr primarily supports uh, military operations. Next slide, uh, next bullet, please. <clears throat> then there's human intelligence. Uh, this is primarily uh, in the Defense Department. In the FBI, we have human, uh, human agents. Uh, the CIA has case officers. These are analysts, uh, not they're, they specialize in analyzing who can share with us information that is relevant. And they go out and they recruit and talk to people uh, to gain that. But they do a lot of analysis because they have to look for a right, the right subject that has the information that we need to know about. And then you can hit the next two, uh, Susan. Uh, 
counterintelligence, there's an analytic component of that. That is counterintelligence. And I'm also a counterintelligence uh, trained analyst through my military training. They look to, to identify and deter uh, foreign actors from spying against us. So the FBI does a lot of counterintelligence because we're investigating uh, US citizens who may be sharing secrets with foreign powers. And then collection management is, a, there's an analysis, you have to understand what you know and don't know. And a collection manager develops requirements on what we need to know and looks at what kind of, where we can collect that information uh, and, and, and manages that process. So th those, when, you, when you're in the intel community, you'll, you'll be doing one of these roles uh, as an intelligence analyst. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so I just have two graphics. They're both from the Army Military Intelligence Analysis Manual, but they, they show what the process is because, again, uh, unless you're attending an intelligence training course, you may not fully understand, well, what, what do I do day to day? So the, the intelligence analyst process, it, it, it's always the, uh, pictured in a circle or a, 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 a continuous process because it never, there is no start and end point. If I had to say, to share with you, plan and direct would probably be a good starting point. But when you plan what your intelligence question is, what a decision maker needs to know, and what, do, what information do I need to collect, uh, and where can I get it? That kind of starts the process. And then you can see collect and process. So the information comes from someone telling you something, a satellite photograph. Uh, we intercept a uh, cell phone call between two terrorist actors uh, in Afghanistan. That information comes in and then, it, then it's processed. So the data is, is, you know, telephone information. How long was the call? When was the call? You, Data can be processed chronologically. It can be processed all different types of ways, but you have to take all that data and, and put it in a format that then you can make it information. And then you assess that. And if you're a good analyst and you've got a good question and you're collecting relevant data, you'll be able to support uh, or not your hypothesis. And so that's when you're going to produce your intelligence report. And that's given to a decision maker, which is disseminate in the upper left corner. But again, once the decision maker reads that report, he or she may say, well, you've told me this, but what's the impact if something else happens? And that may generate a whole new uh, uh, set of requirements. It's also continuous because there are threat information that we are looking at every day. We never answer the question, is a terrorist seeking to attack the United States? We probably, we say yes, but we're constantly, that is a standing intel requirement because we're constantly going to be collecting information about uh, information about an actor who wants to conduct an attack inside the United States. So that that question will never be answered because we're always going to be looking looking for it. Uh, next slide, please, Susan. Uh, so this is another view of, and again, this is from the Army Manual, but it's one of the best views that I've seen. And, and it goes counterclockwise. So again, it starts to, if you look at what the key, key parts of the intelligence cycle are, the intelligence analysis process, you know, it starts with requirements. So you need to know, you need, you, you need to know what your gaps are, what you don't know, you need to know what you do know, and then you create a requirement or an intelligence question uh, where you have it, you have a question that has to be answered. And so from that, you develop requirements, and these are tasked out. Uh, we have requests for collection in the FBI where if a special agent has a source that is a person that has access to information, an analyst will do a request for collection and say, here are six questions that we need to know. Ask these to your source at the next time that you have a source meeting. Or if it's uh, something we need to know about a North Korean missile, then they will task the satellite be over this testing area from one o'clock to midnight, because that's when we assess the North Koreans may be testing their missile and we want satellite to see what's going on down. So that becomes the screen, which you see the, the analyst sitting in front of his multi-screen. So an information can come in through all kinds, you know, unmanned aerial systems, RFI responses, which are someone telling us something, signals intercepts, uh, cables from State Department embassies because they talk to foreign diplomats, 
all that information comes in and a screen and then you see at the bottom left is then analyzed. You have to determine the information. Is it reliable and accurate? If it's coming from a human source, is it timely? When did the satellite take that picture? Is it relevant? Was it in the right area? If it's not, is there something in that we can we can derive from? So, and you can see the little picture. This is when you talk about uh, processing, like you you maybe put the information on a timeline. So you look at it chronologically, you put the information on a map. So you do graphical analysis. If you're looking at a, uh, if we're looking at a corrupt, uh, a doctor who's over prescribing opioids in the FBI, we'll map out where his patients live. And we've discovered through looking at patient data, there's a guy in Brooklyn and most of his patients live in Pennsylvania uh, and they're all getting prescriptions for opioids. That is probably a red flag that he's over prescribing because what patient from Pennsylvania is gonna drive all the way to Brooklyn. So if you map out information or when a cell phone hits a cell tower, you can identify uh, graphically where things could be going on. And then you integrate that all into your, into your hypothesis to answer the question, do you have the data that supports or doesn't support? That Korean missile question, if we see a missile test and we look at how far it flew and how accurate it was, and we think about other information that says, uh, you know, the, the North Koreans have this amount of nuclear material or this reactor's producing material, then we can assess, are they going to be able to have a missile that can carry a warhead that can hit the United States within the next three to five years? And then all of that information is put in different products, Intel reports, uh, graphical Intel summaries. We have different types of reports, Intel bulletins, assessments uh, in the Intel community. And that's how it's delivered to uh, decision makers. Next slide, please. So this is uh, who makes up the intelligence community. So if you're looking for a career in intelligence, you need to know where that you could where you would could work. And these are the different uh, entities. The seventeen, there's sixteen at the bottom plus the director of national intelligence make up the intelligence community. So I'm going to quickly describe each one and what they do, so you get a sense of where you could find, if you're interested in intelligence career, where and what this, who the agencies are and what they do. So at the top is the Office of Director of National Intelligence, ODNI. This is an organization founded after 9-11. And it, it integrates intel across, it, it, is, it, it is at the top of the page because it directs the entire intel community. Before 9-11 in 2001, the Central Intelligence Agency on the far left the director of central intelligence was dual hatted also as the unofficial head of the intelligence community. But as you can see, that's almost, uh, you know, first among equals, but they realized after September 11th that the CIA director was also going to be, have his own CIA interests and maybe other organizations wouldn't, you know, they, he, he, he or she really couldn't direct the community. So they created ODNI and they serve as he, and it's a he uh, or she, it's a, it's a, she now is the principal advisor to the president on intelligence matters. But they also direct all of, and, and we get tasking that there's intelligence requirements at the national level that get tasked out to different agencies. So if I go from left to right, you have the CIA, which is the mission of the CIA is to provide intelligence analysis to the president, and the executive branch to support policy decisions of the United States. So that's their primary analytic role. They are the lead agency for producing the presidential daily read book. So they are, everyone in the CIA is part of the intelligence community, uh, but their role is really to collect intelligence and produce analysis uh, to support national, uh, primarily executive branch uh, decisions. Then you have the Department of Defense entities. More people in the intelligence community are work for the Pentagon and the Department of Defense than any other organization. If you take all of the people in these uh, eight Department of Defense entities, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people. So the Defense Intelligence Agency is like the CIA for the DOD. So the 
the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs have the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, my former boss, the Army G2, Lieutenant General Barrier, is now the CIA director. And they provide all source analysis specifically on political and military topics to support the Secretary of Defense and the Defense Department. Then you have the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the NGA. Uh, they, as I talked about geospatial analysis, they, through satellites and other sensors, collect, geo, collect basically images uh, to, to provide intelligence to, uh, for military purposes. And those geospatial intelligence has to understand how to look at pictures and make sense of it, and then to analyze them. The National Reconnaissance Office it actually exists to, to they, they design, build, and launch all the satellites that sensors for other organizations sit on. So the NRO will launch a satellite, and there are a package for the NGA, the, the geospatial sensor, and then there's a signals intelligence sensor, and that's for the National Security Agency. So the National Security Agency, its job is to collect signals intelligence, both communications, electronics, so the, and they also have the job of protecting our own and developing codes uh, to protect American information and breaking codes of foreign power so we can read things and, and gain information. But primarily at the National Security Agency, there are mathematicians, there are computer scientists, uh, and there's our linguists. So because a lot of the information that's communications intelligence is, is collected in a foreign language, the NSA translates it, and then, and then their analysts produce these uh, signals uh, messages or intercepts. And then each of the four parts of the um, military service, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and now uh, Space Force, uh, even though Space Force actually is an independent space uh, and military service, it falls under the Secretary of the Air Force. Each of those components. So in the Army, there are military intelligence analysts, and that's what I served in. Uh, so some people in the Army are, you know, tank drivers or field artillery or quartermaster. They're not part of the intel community, but the intelligence analysts in the Army, the naval intelligence analysts that work for the, in the Army, we call it the G2. The, the staff section, you know, the first is personnel, second is uh, intelligence, third is operations. So G2 in the Army, N2 in the Navy, A2 in the Air Force, and the Marine Corps calls it director of information. So there are intel analysts in the different service components, both at the tactical level, you know, a battalion, an infantry battalion commander has an S2 that provides intelligence analysts to him or her. And in the Navy, Air Force, and Marines. So there, you're, there, that's my route in the intel community was I was in the Army and became a military intelligence officer and served in a variety of intelligence roles as an Army officer. And then on the right side of the screen are other uh, government entities. So in these entities, just like in the Army, Navy, and Air Force, some people in the agency are in the intel community. So you have under the Department of Justice, the FBI, so as a civilian analyst, I am an intel analyst in the FBI. So I'm an intel community member. We have intel analysts and national security special agents. <clears throat> the Drug Enforcement Agency has intel analysts that specialize in analyzing narcotics trafficking and, and smuggling. The Department of Energy has an Office of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. They primarily look at and, uh, and now they collect and analyze information about enemy or not enemy foreign nuclear developments and also look at protecting nuclear power plants and nuclear energy inside the United States. The Department of Homeland Security, there's the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard is a law enforcement organization. So they're not part of the DOD uh, because they have law enforcement powers. Uh, and so they're part of Department of Homeland Security. The Coast Guard has an intelligence service. And then the DHS itself has its own Office of Intelligence and Analysis, Intel analysts that analyze and provide information to the director of the DHS and to meet DHS requirements. And then there is the Department of State. They have the Bureau of Intelligence and Research that provides intelligence uh, to the Secretary of State and to ambassadors and primarily focused on political uh, intelligence. And then finally, the Department of Treasury has an Office of Intelligence Analysis. They're primarily looking at analyzing 
financial transactions related to uh, illegal criminal activity, you know, terrorists or, or dark money and our terrorists moving money uh, and, and those kinds of uh, transactions. So again, if you go on this slide in the CIA, everybody is an Indian intel, is a part of the intelligence community. Under the DOD, uh, the DIA, NGA, NRO, and NSA, all of those individuals that work in those agencies are part of the intel community. And then under the service components, if you're an intelligence, a military intelligence, naval intelligence, air force, or marine intelligence officer or soldier, you're part of the intel agency. And then in those other government entities, they have components of the intel community in these eight, uh, organizations that are listed. So again, some of the intelligence roles that you're looking at are technical. Uh, some are, you know, in the State Department, they look at political activity. In the DOD, they look at military activity. And then in, the, in uh, those other government agencies, they also do criminal analysis as well. Uh, next slide, please. So that was a lot of information, but that was basically Intel community and Intel analysis 101. I spoke very quickly because I wanted to get all that information in. But I'm going to transition now to some information for you that says, well, if you're interested, if that sounds like something you would like to do, you, you like to write, you like to speak, you have intellectual curiosity, you're interested in a, a, analysis to protect and defend the United States. I'm sharing two resources on this page. This is, if you, you've probably heard about usajobs.gov which is the site you're going to go to if you want to work full time for the federal government. There is a specific site, and you can click the next slide, please, called intelligencecareers.gov. And it's a portal uh, because usajobs.gov is not really user-friendly and not very intuitive. The NSA, which is a very technical organization, actually created a portal that not only makes it easy to find job openings in the NSA, but it also has a lot of other career material there. So they wanted to make the portal an, a recruiting tool. And it proved so popular that DIA, DHS Office of Intelligence Analysis, NGA and NRO all hopped on board. So those agencies use this portal to uh, post their job openings and post information about what it's like to work at these agencies. So this is a great tool. I highly recommend you go to www.intelligencecareers.gov uh, if you're interested in these agencies. Now, if you're interested in the FBI, you have to go to fbijobs.gov and under the, uh, the other agencies, you'll go to usajobs.gov. But this is really a great portal. Even if you're not interested in working, your heart is set on the CIA, there is good career type information available at this site. And if you hit the next, uh, and then there is also, it sounds like careers, in www.intelligence.gov slash careers is a site run by the DNI. And it talks about what are careers intelligence all about. So beyond my short presentation, if you would like more information about what do Intel analysts do, what do the different agencies do, this is a site that provides some more uh, additional information. It's not a job portal. It's a page that has a lot of information about the intelligence community. And again, it's hosted by the Office of uh, Director of National Intelligence. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and you can hit uh, two bullets, go to the next one. So then the DNI, uh, and you can hit the next one too. These are just two additional uh, information. And again, this is being recorded. Uh, uh, Su Susan, you can feel free to email these links out to everybody that was on the, the call so people don't have to write things down. But the first is a, a book that comes out about every four or five years called US National Intelligence and Overview. It's a really great you know, guide to the, it's a US citizen's guide to the intelligence community. And it's produced and published, uh, it's online and PDF at the DNI website. But that is another place that you can find uh, information. And then, the last is a link to a page that is on the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, AFIO.com. And it's Intelligence as a Career. So it's a really nice booklet about more information beyond what I'm showing you about what analysts do, 
what is the Intel community about, who is in the Intel community. As you can see, it's, it's designed for students, parents. It's really the AFIO does a lot, the Association for Intelligence Officers, about recruiting and getting, getting the next generation into the intelligence uh, community. So that is a nice resource as well. It's a pretty large, it's like, I don't know how they scanned it, but it's, 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 it's very, very big. So it's, I recommend if you're interested, you can go to the AFIO.com website and then download it. But that's just, that provides some more background for you. Uh, and next slide, please. So yeah, just, you can just go to the, this one bullet. So, uh, and then you can stop there. So these are, if you're interested in, you know, what I've, if you've just listened to me talk on and on and on, and you say, oh, that sounds really interesting. I really, you know, I, I'm visual. I would like to have a career looking at imagery and making sense of it and doing analysis that, that supports you know, at the NGA. Yeah. You know, how do I, how do I start? So the, the, the internships I would recommend, I mean, there is the federal honors intern program. Uh, that is a good way to get into intelligence career because if you are selected and you go through the process and the background check, you got the, you get the top secret clearance. And it's very likely that most agencies do make job offers to those students that have gone through the internship program. As a liberal arts college mentor, I've had uh, three of my mentees have done the federal honors intern program, one at the DIA, one at the NGA. Uh, and one at the State Department, and they they all three received job offers. So uh, one is currently at the DIA, one was at the State Department, but now works for Booz Allen in cybersecurity, and the NGA analyst then joined a contractor uh, and works at the National Counterterrorism Center. So that is a good way uh, to get your foot in the door. Uh, it's very competitive, so not everybody will be selected. Some other ways that you can look are at the state, uh, you know, law enforcement level, the Pennsylvania State Police, the New Jersey State Police, or those state agencies. In New Jersey, we have an Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. One, the mentee that I that I mentored that got the Federal Honors Intern at the NJ between her sophomore and junior, she did an internship with the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness Critical Infrastructure Bureau. So. You can go whatever state you live in. You can look and see, you know, what's the state law enforcement agency, a state police, are there homeland security or intel or, you know, emergency management type functions at the state level. Go to their website and see what internship programs they have. And then also at the state and county level, you know, there are prosecutors and investigators. Sometimes a lot of states like in New Jersey, the for cities and towns that don't have their own detectives, they've got investigators at the county level. That's the main court. Uh, looking at internships there will will provide you with, you know, you, they're doing analysis when they're looking for information in those criminal cases. So that's another opportunity uh, to look for an internship that will give you exposure to that analytic process, creating a requirement, collecting data. And that's what investigators or detectives do. And then prosecutors, they use that data when they're providing their, they want to provide a data to the jury that shows someone's guilty. So that process of knowing what you need to collect and looking at information and evidence and processing it has an analytic uh, component to it. If you've already getting ready to graduate, there is the Federal Collegiate Hiring Initiative. Uh, you're eligible your senior year up to a year before you graduate and then up to 24 months after you graduate. There are jobs, so there are specific positions in each of the Intel community that are reserved just for recent college graduates. And that way we ensure we're getting uh, the next generation uh, in our agency. So that's something to look for as well. Uh, that job opening may not be in the Intel analyst role at the FBI, we rarely offer, but we do offer positions in, in our professional support role. And once you're in the federal government, so if you are hired by the FBI as a non-analyst or intel role, you can actually apply because when we do have openings, we often go and let other FBI employees, uh, not outside individuals apply. So if you get a, another student that I mentor 
mentor, mentored is now working for the Navy in their in a security role uh, in a Navy a research laboratory, and she's now she is eligible to apply for after she gets some experience intel roles in the federal government because she's already a federal employee. And often there are when positions come open they will they will be posted just for current federal employees uh, to apply, not for non-federal employees. So you can look for collegiate hiring initiative jobs at Intel agencies and uh, or non-Intel agencies, but it is a way to get into the federal government. And you can pick the next two. Uh, military intelligence service, I'm throwing that open. That's the wet path I took. I do, the student that I mentor, that is something to, to look at. Uh, I've, I've talked to students and, you know, I have a, uh, a student that I, that I work with. She's not at Penn State. She's actually a friend of my daughter's. And she enlisted in the, as she graduated from college and actually joined the National Guard in Minnesota because there were positions in the National Guard in military intelligence. And so she went through military intelligence training, received her top secret clearance on her training. And now with that on her resume, she is now more competitive when she looks for an intelligence community position. She already has a top secret clearance and she has intelligence training. So that is something, uh, that's a path. I know it's not, oh, many people wouldn't consider that, but that is a role or a pathway uh, into intelligence. And then finally, I would say uh, a number of analysts in, my, this is my own experience when, we, when, when the FBI is looking uh, for uh, new analysts, one thing that is a help, one thing that is a discriminator or it sets you apart is to have a graduate degree in international relations or global studies. So this is one field Intel community when they talk about, is it worthwhile to get a graduate degree? If you're really uh, looking for a career in intelligence, a graduate degree is something that definitely makes you more attractive uh, as a candidate to join the Intel community if you've got that master's degree, primarily because in an international relations or global studies master's, you are going to do a, thesis, a research thesis project as part of your master's degree. So you'll have that experience of creating a research question or hypothesis, collecting the data, analyzing it, and, and, and then writing it and defending your dissertation uh, or your, not a dissertation, but you will, get that, it, you'll, you'll sharpen those skills. And most of the people in the Intel community know that. So for example, in the FBI, it's not only attractive, but if you join with a, uh, the FBI as an analyst with a master's degree, you start at a higher pay scale. So that is something to think about as well. I share that with my students to consider is there is a benefit uh, in both what you learn and then on your resume saying that you have a master's degree is something that definitely uh, it makes you more competitive. Okay, in the few minutes, and I wanna open it for questions, I'm just gonna quickly go through what the FBI does since I'm an analyst with the FBI. People say, well, what does the FBI do? You know, it, what, is it, what, what, is, what are they doing and what's the role of the Intel analyst? So the, F, the mission of the FBI <clears throat> is to protect the American people and uphold the constitution of the United States. And next slide. We do have a national security mission. Uh, I know that you're probably all too young to remember, but I knew Susan may remember that after 9-11, the attacks of September 11th, there was this big debate. Is the FBI, the FBI needs to become an intelligence agency and should we create a new intelligence agency? And why didn't the FBI? Well, well the FBI has always had a national security mission as far back as 1919 when they created uh, a general intelligence division. So. If you know about the history of the FBI, the FBI investigated anarchists in the 1920s. We investigated the Russian spies that were stealing our nuclear secrets. The FBI has always been since World War II. It's actually, we started the Bureau of uh, the General Intelligence Division, but in World War II in 1943, the FBI became the lead agency uh, to, to conduct intelligence investigations in the United States. And that was signed by uh, President Roosevelt. So uh, next slide, please. And in World War II, we actually sent special agents in the Western Hemisphere to collect information and monitor Nazis and pro-Nazi groups. So before the CIA existed, which 
they weren't created until after World War II. So we had the Office of Strategic Services. But the FBI actually had a foreign intelligence mission. <clears throat> now, the CIA is the lead agency in the U.S. for over for internet for foreign intelligence. So anything outside the United States is the CIA is the lead agency. But any intelligence collection inside the United States uh, is the uh, responsibility of the FBI. Next slide, please. So these are the priorities. Uh, again, protecting the United States from terrorist attacks since September 11th has you know it shifted primarily. Before 9-11, it was a criminal focus, uh, but now it's a national security focus. So protecting <clears throat> from a terrorist attack, foreign intelligence and espionage, and cyber-based attacks. So the first two are roles that our national security division focuses on. And then you can see some other roles. So I work on the criminal side. In the, I'm part of the intelligence community. The special agents on the criminal side are not part of, they are not, the, my salary is paid for by the uh, general intelligence budget of the United States. Uh, special agents working criminal matters are paid for by through the DOJ budget. But you can see those those areas that I focus on: public corruption, civil rights, a white collar crime, including healthcare fraud and complex financial fraud. The FBI is the lead agency, so no other organization ha you know has the responsibility of investigating public corruption or civil rights. It's the FBI. So that's that's the main focus of our intelligence. If we look at things like transnational and national criminal organizations and enterprises, we share that the DEA does investigations and drugs, but these are what the priorities of the FBI are. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is our focus. I'll let you, still get you look at that again, uh, conduct investigations and authorized intelligence collection to identify threats. Uh, conduct counterintelligence, so we're responsible for identifying and thwarting espionage, both by US citizens that betray their country, as well as foreign actors that are here trying to uh, collect information and spy, uh, coordinate uh, other agencies when we're looking at uh, protecting critical infrastructure. And then we want to identify, disrupt, and dismantle criminal enterprises. So again, I'm looking, the special agents that my squad supports for those intelligence are looking at identifying state and local politicians and, and, and national politicians that are corrupt, <clears throat> civil rights violations, which is of course very important right now, and healthcare fraud, which is something that you know costs uh, people in the United States billions, it costs everyone because it makes our insurance premiums higher uh, if doctors are you know billing for unnecessary procedures or uh, also it contributes, you know, we're looking at opioid uh, addiction, doctors over prescribing. Opioid. So these are the focus areas of the FBI. And then the next slide, this is my last slide. So this is how the FBI is organized. <clears throat> we have our director and deputy director. And then you can see across the middle, we've got, I work in the intelligence branch. So we have an executive assistant director. So all of the intelligence analysts and staff operational specialists work under the intel branch. So I'm assigned to the Newark field office uh, I have an, a super senior supervisor special agent as my boss. So there's an intel analyst above me who then works for the special agent in charge. But the intel analysts and staff operational specialists that work for me are embedded on criminal investigative squads. So we have a squad that does uh, healthcare fraud investigations with the supervisor special agent. I have an analyst and a SOS embedded on that squad. So they work for me, but they take their day-to-day -day direction from that investigative squad because they're supporting the special agents with analysis. So if you look, the, all of our special agents belong to either the national security branch. So that includes agents in, who are conducting counterterrorism and counterintelligence investigations. And then we've got a cyber and criminal branch. So my squads, those special agents, and all work for the assistant special agent charge who's in charge of white collar crime. So our criminal programs are either <clears throat> Uh, violent crime and criminal enterprise or white collar crime. And so the agent, I mean, my analysts work on uh, supporting those investigations again, as I shared, public corruption, civil rights, and healthcare fraud. And so they fall under the criminal investigation. And then there's also cyber, uh, because cyber is a lot of criminal activity. Uh, it falls, it's not part of the national security branch, it's part of the uh, cyber and uh, criminal and cyber branch. 
So this is the makeup. This is how the FBI is structured. So <clears throat> there are 56 field offices in the United States, and each of the field office has agents assigned to these programs who conduct so in, Nor in Newark, New Jersey. We cover the state of New Jersey, except for the two counties opposite Philadelphia. And day to day, we are, our analysts are either identifying new information from partners or from reading intelligence report. So they're identifying something new. Uh, my analysts will look at Medicare billing records and identify a doctor and then have an agent open up a case or they respond to requests for information. While a case is going on, a special agent say, will be looking at someone and that someone starts speaking on the phone with, with other people. Uh, the analyst or SOS will, you know, will receive a request from the agent. Find out who these two people are, and you know, they'll collect information to determine uh, should we also include them in the investigation or not. So they push intelligence to the investigative squads, and then they also receive requests for uh, intelligence from the agents as they're conducting their investigations. So that's just a short overview of the FBI uh, where I work. I open it up. I did want to wrap up so that we did have some time so we could do some live questions. Uh, there's my uh, uh, FBI. Actually, uh, Susan, my, I just realized my FBI email is out of date. We upgraded to uh, Office 365. So uh, you can send anyone uh, my LinkedIn profile or my uh, and my email. If you don't want to ask a question now, I'm always available uh, if anyone on the call wants to reach out to me. Uh, I'm a mentor and have a lot of contacts, so I will open it up to uh, questions. Kevin, should I be using the uh, personal email that you and I have been communicating on? Or no, is it's, it's, it's FBI? It, yeah, it's Casey Wolforst at FBI.gov. Okay, I will update yeah. the slides before um, mm -hmm. we share those out. Yes, it's Casey Wolforst, and you can put my LinkedIn profile on there as well. Perfect. I know you have that. Perfect. So I know that someone had asked um, if the recording would be available and it will be in the YouTube playlist for um, the College of the Liberal Arts. Let's see what other kinds of questions we have here. Um, are you able to see the questions as well, Kevin? Yes, yeah. I am. I have okay. my chat. I have the question open. So the first one, uh, do you have any advice for polygraphs? Okay, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's tough. I had uh, the only time I've been polygraphed is as part as uh, part of my clearance for the FBI, and it's a lifestyle poly, and it's designed to make you uncomfortable. So all I can say is, I you I don't I was nervous, so just uh, be confident and but it, you know, be prepared. I think the best way not to be nervous is to understand that you probably will be nervous and just deal with that. But it's it's not a pleasant experience. And it's tough. So uh, if you join the FBI, you will receive a polygraph, a lifestyle polygraph. In the DO Defense Department and the other intel agencies, they do not polygraph uh, unless you're getting some sort of special access. So I've never had a polygraph as an Army intelligence analyst, but I have a, when you join the FBI as part of the background, they give you a lifestyle poly. So they're going to ask you about narcotics use and other things. Once that's done, then you get a poly every five years, which is just uh, basically they instituted it after Hansen. So they're asking you, they're, have you shared intel with foreign power? So those, the subsequent polys are much easier because they're just a, a security poly. But I really, I, I, I can't share with you other than be truthful, but understand that, you're, that the polygrapher is probably going to try to make you nervous because that's part of the poly process. Uh, Alex, if you have your top secret from the Army and you join the FBI, they will do their own background. They, I have a top secret clearance as a reservist, and that did not transfer over to the FBI. The FBI, because it's the law enforcement organization and you have access to criminal investigations, does their own background investigation and poly. So they, it, 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 it's helpful to have a top secret clearance because it'll make you competitive because they're like, okay, you've already, you're already got a top secret clearance, but you will still go through the background investigation because the FBI conducts its own background investigation. Uh, for the military combat arms background, I mean, for, for the special agent, it definitely is competitive. That's one of the ways that uh, they recruit special agents or lawyers, CPA, certified public accountants, uh, uh, cyber specialists and military officers. 
it in in as a intel analyst i mean one of my analysts was in the army as a signal specialist as a listed and not an analyst uh i mean it would it would it would make you competitive that you have experience but i don't think it's not going to like put you above other people who are applying for the intel analyst job because they on the analyst side they definitely look for military uh, experience in the intelligence field as opposed to the broader combat arms background. And the background check is, I mean, the background check is is just like the background check I had for the Army. They're going to, uh, well, it's, it's changing now. The, the, the defense, the intel community is moving to continuous evaluation. This was actually started by the Army when I was in the Pentagon. So what they do now is they don't treat every investigation the same. They use those commercial tools that private sector company use that looks at your social media, your financial information. They basically run you through and see has, do you have foreign travel? Have you declared bankruptcy? Are you overextended on your credit? Have you been arrested? And if those red flags come up, then they start doing the invest background where they go and talk to your neighbors and your teachers. But if you go through the process and no red flags comes up, then they, you just get the clearance. And this way, the agents can focus on reinvestigations and it speeds up the process. <clears throat> but the background is basically trying to determine, are you, are there activities in your background that would make you susceptible to being recruited by a foreign power and portraying the secrets that you are entrusted with. So the background is gonna look at, do you have a lot of foreign travel? Do you have foreign relatives that you have close association with? Are you in debt? Uh, because oftentimes people recruit uh, individuals who are in debt because they offer to pay them money for secrets. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, background? And are you a trustworthy person? When they ask your neighbors, they say, would you trust Kevin? with national secrets. So that's the process of the background investigation. Uh, so if you have a military background, I mean, that's good. <clears throat> when you're applying to a job in a federal, well, first you have veterans preference uh, because the there is a, the federal government has an initiative that veterans do get a preference. Uh, in the Intel field, it's like a five point preference. So it, it's not, it, it doesn't mean they're automatically gonna take you. But I mean, that does reflect well because you generally come from an organization, if you've been in the military where you have been trusted with, with information, uh, you, they know that you've been through training and things like that. So I would say uh, it, 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 it is helpful that if you're applying for a federal civilian job, if you are prior military, there are certain benefits there. Uh, apart from a graduate degree, I, 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 uh, several students that I mentor have had uh, the security and risk analysis minor or major. I think that's a good field. I would say in the intelligence field, definitely something like international relations is more applicable than criminology or criminal justice because we are analysts, uh, not law enforcement officers. So in that, again, the, the, the majors that would be beneficial, I mean, security and risk analysis are because that, you're learning that process of collecting data to assess risk. And that's basically the analytic process. Uh, the other majors, I mean, history, international relations. I had to write a history senior thesis uh, project as a history major. So any degree where you, where you are doing social science research and then writing about it, but maybe not in an academic way, I mean, history, you have to write very cl clearly, but I would say the, the double major degree is the degree where you're going to have classes that support those, those uh, competencies of social, of, of research, you know, not scientific research, but social science research, where you're going to be writing uh, research projects and you have writing samples and where you're going to be present, presenting your findings. Uh, let me see. Uh, inter intelligence being a government. Oh, uh, things such as working in an embassy. Uh, I, the, the people move back and forth in the end. I think the what you're trying to ask is, you know, 
people move from the state. There are I work with State Department officers both at the G two. There, there's a the intel community and State Department have very close cooperation. Uh, so so there is a, a transfers between both of those agencies. Uh, uh, does a having a relative who's married? I mean that that it depends. Like everything. Uh, they're going to, I mean, if you would report that and they will determine, is that something, how close you are with that relative and what is that foreign national? Is that foreign national someone who emigrated from China? Do they still live in China? Are they part of the Chinese military? So basically all the factors uh, that you would, you know, there's, that's not a yes or no answer. The, the, they're going to collect it. And then when they do the adjudication of the, uh, Clearance, they're going to look and say, "Okay, I mean, I have I have worked with in military intelligence officers who are married to foreign nationals, uh, so it's not something that it's no, you can't get your clearance. It all depends on what who that person is, what do they do, and what are their links. So uh, it's it's definitely uh, not a yes or no answer." Kevin, I wasn't sure if you saw Alex's question, and I apologize if you already answered it. He was asking if he still had the top secret oh, yeah. in the army. Yeah, no, the F in the FBI, you have to. Uh, even with my TS clearance from the army, I still had to go through the full background investigation. Uh, they, the FBI is the only agency that doesn't recognize the DOD or other clearances because we are a law enforcement agency and you're getting access to very sensitive criminal investigations. They do their own uh, background investigation. Uh, so it'll be helpful that if you've already got a TS because uh, they you'll probably you'll be a more attractive candidate. But even with the TS clearance, you will still have to go through. So uh, when I was an Army reservist and an FBI analyst, I had two clearances in the clearance system: my Army clearance and my FBI clearance. Other agencies will take that. I, I'm pretty sure DHS, DEA, if you've got the military clearance, they'll just transfer that over. But the FBI does their own background investigation. So we also have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, okay. Someone who's got signal intelligence analyst experience in the Marines um, and is asking about how that might stack up compared to someone who interned at the actual agency that they're applying okay. to work for. Okay, so could you ask that again? I'm, try, I, I'm trying to open So it. Um, it's in the chat. I have five years okay. experience as a SIG, SIG analyst in the Marine Corps. I'll be finishing my bachelor's in economics next fall wife and daughter, and none of the internship opportunities seem realistic for someone in my situation. Position I'm looking into is as an analyst. For those reviewing my application, how does the five years and experience in a separate intelligence field compare to someone who interned at the actual agency that they're applying to? Uh, I mean, you're, 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 you'd be competitive. I mean, the, the intern has the benefit that they've gone through the background check. They've, they, they are there and hand, have the hands-on experience. So Again, that's an it depends question as well. If if there if there's multiple slots that they have open and they're looking outside the interns, and they see that you have signals intelligence experience, or you've you've had a background, you've had a clearance already, that would could make you competitive. But it it just depends. Uh, I mean, it's a good background to have, but I would just say from my own experience that the benefit of the uh, internship program is those interns have already gone through the background clearance of that agency and have already have experience in the agency. Um, and then someone asked, would you be able to speak on the transition from the military into a civilian agency within the intelligence community? Uh, I, I, the transition was fairly smooth. Before, when I first joined the FBI, I worked counterintelligence, uh, not criminal intelligence. And so there was a lot of crossover. The, I joined the, the military intelligence analyst process is is similar to the all source analyst process in civilian agencies and most of the civilian agencies like when I was working counterintelligence we were working things like investigations into Iran trying to buy uh, prohibited equipment in New Jersey so understanding from the military side what Iran was about and what they were focused on because I had been a Middle East, North East, North East analyst, it was pretty easy. The other thing is a lot of civilian analysts and the special agents come from the military. So even where I work, multiple, a lot of the special agents have military backgrounds. So 
there, it, it's a pretty smooth transition. It's, it's not like there's a culture shock that you have to, that you'll face. It was pretty smooth. Uh, and then the person who had the signals uh, intelligence experience is asking if you know of internships that could seem realistic for them as they all seem to be in-person opportunities. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the state, I think the State Department has still has a virtual internship. They do. They yeah, do. so that, that's one option. And then I, uh, you know, with the signals background, maybe with some of the defense contractors may still, I, 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 again, I'm not a signal. I, I, I'm an all source analyst and, and I really haven't used my geospatial and counterintelligence in the FBI's primarily an all source job. So I'm, I'm trying to, to think, I, it, that's a tough question, but I, I, maybe in some of the defense contractors, you may uh, get the opportunity in turn because they put, there, there's, a bot, there's a group of defense contractors that we call body shops that just provide people. The contract, you know, the NSA needs some signals intelligence. They don't want to hire a new full-time employees. So a contractor will provide some people. And so if you go to clearancejobs.gov, you may find some, there may be information, but that may be somewhere where you could work virtually. Of course, the problem with doing classified intel work virtually is you can, really can't do it. So a lot of the agencies that, you know, either they, like the FBI, we didn't do virtual internships because we need the interns on our system because that's where our case information is, so. Um, and then for the CIA, do you recommend joining the military? Uh, I mean, again, a military background, uh, you know, be, you get the, getting the veteran's preference and the experience. I mean, there, I know, I know analysts that have left the uh, army intelligence and then gotten jobs as CIA intelligence analysts or as you know, hum, uh, case officers. So, I mean, I think I know in the FBI, we have lots of people that transition from the military into intelligence analysts and special agent jobs. So I, I think the CIA would be similar, that that would be a experience that would make you competitive when you apply there. Um, so we have two more questions that have come on the Q&A, but I just wanna do a little PSA here. I know we're a little bit past the time. So um, as people need to drop off, please feel free. But I did wanna put a plug in. Kevin has mentioned a couple of times He's an alumni mentor for the college and has very kindly given his time to mentor lots of students over the years. And so I just wanted to give a little plug for the alumni mentor program in the college. You can find information about it on our website. It's um, under the Career Enrichment Network. There's a link there. And it's open to students at any time, as long as you've completed at least one semester and you have at least one semester remaining. Um, so it, feel, feel free, if you've got questions about that, contact one of the career coaches in our office but I would just encourage you to perhaps consider that as a way to connect with an alumnus or an alumna who's in a career field that you're interested in and who has a lot of direct experience and advice to share. Um, oh, and I, I, I do see the, the, the final the Q &A. question. So, yeah, so okay. a bachelor's of political science, this is just my assessment, I think would be competitive because you are gonna study, uh, have an international outlook. I would say the public policy would be a little less competitive because most of the intel agencies, all the DOD ones and the FBI as well, understanding what's happening globally has such an impact on the investigations that we're doing, especially the terrorism or even the criminal investigations, because in New Jersey, most of our, our criminal enterprise is transnational, that in the international relations, you're going to, you're going to gain information about what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Afghanistan, the difference between ISIS and ta the Taliban. You're going to understand, and you could focus on what China's strategy is, what Russia's. So I think the international relations would be more competitive than the masters of public policy, because it's not only the research process, but you're going to gather and build your expertise about global issues. And that is really, like I said, even analysts in, New, in the FBI in New Jersey have to understand what's happening uh, if they're working terrorism or criminal threats because it has such an impact. Uh, so I think international relations masters would be more competitive than public policy. But as an undergraduate, I think political, if you, if you focus your political science classes on global political science issues, perhaps, rather than you know internal US domestic uh, political science, I think that would be more competitive. 
And then the final one, okay, why did you switch? Actually, I was offered a position at the DIA when I was mobilized, and that's really what I wanted to do. Uh, but my uh, spouse did not want to move to uh, the Beltway. We live in New Jersey, and she was happy living in New Jersey. Uh, so I looked at other options, and the FBI uh, has intel components in each of the 56 field offices. So I was able to join the FBI. So I, I basically didn't say, oh, I want to join the FBI. I wanted to be an intel analyst. And the FBI was the opportunity to work in our North field office and not have to move uh, down to DC. So that's, that's what led me uh, to the FBI. So it was more of a lifestyle, but I've been very happy. It's a great, it's a, it's a fantastic organization. I love working there. I'm, I'm excited, uh, you know, every time that I go into work in some ways more than the DOD, because you actually get to work on cases where you see you know, a doctor arrested uh, who was over prescribing opioids or someone who was committing civil rights violations, you know, a police officer uh, investigated and we just arrested, you know, two Patterson police officers to a civil rights investigation because they were uh, committing color of law violations against uh, minorities in, 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 in their city. So it's a very rewarding when you can, you know, you can contribute to something that's actually improving the lives of the Americans. So. So, but that's how I ended up uh, in the FBI. Well, Kevin, I want to say thank you for taking the time to talk with us, to give such a nice overview of careers in the intelligence community. I know that for people who are interested in it, they may have some of this, but for a mm -hmm. lot of people, they just know they want to work in intelligence and don't necessarily have a good idea of the structure. And I think this was super, super helpful in understanding that and very much appreciate it. And for students, if you have follow up questions, uh, as I said, this session will be on the YouTube channel for the College of the Liberal Arts. So you can just Google that Penn State College of the Liberal Arts YouTube. You'll find the Career Enrichment Network playlist there. Um, I will send out a copy of Kevin's slides to everyone who attended today. But if you have questions about looking for opportunities, uh, working on your resume, getting connected with a mentor, anything like that, please feel free to connect with one of the career coaches. You can do that through your Nittany Lang careers account. And um, of course, if you have questions or any issues with that, just contact us by phone or email. So okay. again, thank you so much for everyone for attending. Yep, and I'm happy to connect. Like I said, if you wanna reach out on LinkedIn, uh, I'm always happy to connect and build my uh, connections with Penn State students, so. All right. So we'll see. Yep. Thanks, everyone.